so uh, good afternoon everyone and uh, welcome back so uh, this session is going to be about android sdk uh, mainly about how to build a viable app at scale using the sdk uh, and i'm going to do this session from the user's perspective uh, and based on the experience that we have acquired uh, by building this uh, application called DNMS, which stands for District Nutrition Management System. So this is a community uh, application which uh, uh, where the public health midwives use uh, this application to work from door to door where uh, there are uh, children under age five and uh, track their nutrition states. Um, and then uh, they use this application to report uh, those information back to the main DHIS2 server so that uh, DHIS2 users and uh, people who are in the administration level can analyze those data to take decisions to improve the nutrition states of the uh, children. So that's that's the uh, primary use case uh, that where we uh, kind of had use uh, Android SDK. So for this session, we uh, also have some uh, prerequisites. Uh, if you are interested in, uh, you know, following the hands-on exercises, so the first one is you might need to have Android uh, Android Studio installed on your system, and the second requirement is to have an Android emulator installed uh, or have an uh, supported Android device so you can test the application while we are, you know, doing some exercises. And uh, this session is mainly is going to be about uh, the just to Android SDK, as I mentioned, and most of the exercises and the demos that uh, are going to be uh, shown in this session are going to be based on Java, uh, not on Kotlin. And uh, I want to highlight that it's not a workshop about Android development, so it's purely uh, going to be about SDK and uh, mainly about the functionalities of the SDK. So uh, Android SDK, I mean, if I, if I uh, want to give a short description about, about the SDK, it's a common good uh, that, allows work, uh, that allows you to work offline, so you don't need to have an internet connection uh, once you develop an uh, application uh, based on the SDK. And the SDK is capable of communicating with uh, the DHIS2 instance uh, when, I mean, if you really want to or to synchronize data. And uh, so obviously it facilitates the development of Android applications uh, based on your custom requirements. So this is a, a high level overview of the SDK. So it's kind, it kind of acts as a mediator between your application or the DHIS2 core application and the DHIS2 API. So it basically uh, allows you to communicate with the remote DHIS2 server via the DHIS2 API, but you don't have to really work uh, work on the DHIS2 API directly. Instead, you can just call some Java methods and uh, do whatever you want to do with the API. Uh, so, what if uh, we simply use an HTTP li library or a database? So, this is how we kind of interacted with the DHIS2 servers before we had uh, had something called Android SDK. So during that time, we kind of had to manually handle authentication. And if we want to support multiple users uh, within the same application, that was really, really hard as well. And we also had to manually manage the databases, like uh, we had to create and define the relationships write queries to access data and uh, also manage the data states, uh, especially, I mean, if you want to synchronize uh, the captured data with the remote instance, we had to, you know, keep those states, whether the data has been newly created, whether the data has been already synchronized with the remote cells or those kind of states, uh, we had to kind of manually manage them. And also uh, if DHIS2 new versions uh, come up with new features, then we kind of had to, you know, go through them, uh, go through the documentation uh, and manually update the Android application to support those new features. And uh, the hardest uh, of all is handling offline online status, as I previously mentioned. Uh, so there can be many, many conflicts uh, in the data. Like uh, if you, if, if someone edit uh, something on the application and it's the same, 
uh, thing has been edited on the remote server. So we kind of had to manually uh, resolve those conflicts, which was not an easy task. Uh, and also the last thing is we have to keep everything in sync with remote uh, server because uh, there can be so many changes that's going on on the remote server like changing metadata and also changing data. So if there's no SDK, we have to write a lot of code to keep these uh, uh, two instances in sync. Uh, so let me quickly go through some of the key features of the Android SDK. So the uh, first feature is the metadata synchronization. So metadata is uh, what kind of defines an uh, DHIS2 instance. So it includes uh, things like programs, program sections, program stages, and so on, uh, especially track entity types, track uh, the program attributes. So there are many, many uh, metadata uh, in DHIS2, which kind of uniquely defines and DHIS2 instance. So if you want to uh, work on the same instance, there should be a copy of the same metadata in the Android application. So this is kind of uh, uh, supported in the SDK. So you don't have to worry about calling hundreds of APIs to uh, do the uh, metadata synchronization. And the next one is about data synchronization. So which is kind of an obvious requirement. So uh, once we have metadata, so th then, then we can create uh, uh, new data based on those metadata and those data should be synchronized between the uh, remote server and the Android uh, application as well. So that is also uh, supported. And then uh, Android SDK provides us a data access layer where we can use uh, to access data in the local database uh, uh, that runs within the uh, Android application as well as we can access uh, uh, data which are available remotely uh, in server, especially when it comes to like track entity instance uh, queries. We can uh, we can instruct the SDK to query uh, both local database and the remote database at the same time. And the uh, last key feature I would like to highlight is support for last uh, latest DHIS2 version. So you don't have to worry about uh, uh, you know, manually uh, supporting latest DHIS2 features or manually changing your code to, uh, you know, uh, handle duplicated API calls or uh, latest API calls. So SDK is going to mask them out, uh, mask all of them out for you and just provide a convenient way to uh, communicate with the remote server. Uh, so let me introduce you to the skeleton app, which uh, we are going to use uh, throughout this. Uh, session. So the skeleton app is uh, something that has been developed by UIO Android team where uh, you can use as the entry point to develop a new application from scratch. Uh, so I mean, it has all the boilerplate uh, code that is required to start with the new application development. And also it has some uh, uh, branches that uh, kind of uh, sh shows you the uh, uh, features available in the SDK. Uh, so it is uh, available on GitHub. Uh, so uh, you could either uh, type this URL or you can simply do a Google search for DHIS2 Android skeleton app and uh, probably it will come as the first result. So uh, uh, there are many, many branches in this uh, repository and master branch is going to be the, you know, the uh, it, it's, it's going to have all the boilerplate code that is required to start a new application development. And then there are use case branches, uh, which kind of shows uh, other capabilities of the uh, SDK. So the uh, first exercise that we are going to do today is, uh, uh, you know, uh, cloning the repository and, uh, uh, you know, uh, start the Android Studio and cloning the repository and, uh, get the master branch of the application uh, up and running on the virtual device. So uh, I, I hope uh, you already got the Android Studio installed and uh, virtual device running already uh, in your machine. So uh, uh, I, I mean, please, uh, I mean, I, I, will, I will kind of demo uh, how to uh, do this, but uh, I encourage you to uh, follow the same. Uh, 
uh, how many of you have Android Studio installed already? Okay, we have few. So yeah, so uh, so in order to start, uh, let me first go through the uh, GitHub repository. So then you can uh, click on code and copy uh, the uh, HTTPS URL. And then uh, in the Android Studio, you can start a new project from version control and paste the URL, uh, copy the wrong one. Uh, for some reason, it's, it's uh, opening the wrong one. So I, I hope it, it will work on your machine. So uh, you, you simply have to paste the uh, URL here and just uh, click on the clone button and it will simply clone the entire GitHub repository uh, onto your local machine and it will start a new Android project and uh, it will probably start indexing the code and then you should be able to uh, um, start the application uh, as if you already have an Android virtual here. So I already have done that step. So I will give you some minutes to uh, go ahead and uh, clone the repository and uh, uh, start building the application. And if you need any help, uh, please raise your hand so I'll be able to come there and uh, help you. Uh, so since we have kind of, uh, I mean, since we have a lot to cover and uh, since we have a limited uh, amount of time, so uh, I will assume that uh, you are following uh, uh, the steps and uh, you have the uh, Android application already cloned. So if, if the if the application is properly cloned, you should be able to start the application by simply uh, clicking on it's not clear, but uh, there's a green uh, run app button uh, in the Android is, uh, Android Studio. So if you click on that button, it should uh, build the application and start the application on the virtual device. Uh, actually, it, it will build the application and install that on, onto the virtual device and it will start the application. So while it's building and starting, uh, let me move on to the uh, next uh, section so it's about the sdk instantiation so if i uh, yeah if, if i go to the uh, if i uh, introduce you to the workflow of the uh, entire android sdk so the first step of uh, uh, using the android sdk is going to be uh, initializing the sdk and then uh, uh, in order to use the rest of the features, you should have a uh, uh, user logged in properly into the application. And then there's a cycle of uh, metadata synchronization, metadata uh, data synchronization, and then do some kind of work, maybe creating new track entity instances, events, and then uploading them back to the server. And the cycle can continue as long as the user is uh, validly logged in. Uh, so when it comes to the uh, initialization of uh, uh, SDK, so uh, in, in, in Android SDK, the entry point uh, is going to be something called D2. So we have this D2 object, which uh, probably stands for DHIS2. And uh, this acts as the entry point for all the uh, uh, modules and repositories in the, uh, uh, which are supported in the Android SDK. Uh, and it is kind of the entry point for uh, doing any operation with the remote DHIS2 server, as well as with the uh, local Android database. And we, uh, for creating the D2 instance, we uh, they have provided something called a D2 manager, which kind of 
accept some uh, configurations which will be used to initialize D2. And it allows you to create a, a D2 instance uh, in a synchronous manner or an asynchronous manner. So you can choose whatever you would like uh, based on your uh, requirement. So this is uh, how you would uh, uh, use D2 configurations. Uh, sorry, D2 manager to initialize a uh, D2 instance. So first you have to have uh, D2 configurations initialized. So for that, you can use the D2 configuration builder and you have to pass a context object into the uh, D2 configuration. So it will be used by the SDK to access uh, device resources such as file system or to populate data, create databases uh, and all. And uh, then you can provide an application name and an application version. So these things will be useful uh, if you want to do analytics uh, in the server side. Uh, I mean, those analytics are not uh, provided out of box uh, from DHIS2. Instead, you can instead you can use uh, your maybe your proxy server uh, to uh, analyze uh, HTTP headers and uh, uh, generate a useful analytics because. App name and app version are going to be uh, included in HTTP headers uh, by the uh, DH, uh, Android SDK with the every uh, REST call that it will be doing uh, with the server. And the, then you can add some additional uh, parameters like uh, uh, network timeouts and all. And then finally, you can build the configuration uh, object that can be passed into the uh, D2 manager to create a D2 instance. Uh, and then uh, uh, once once you are uh, once you have passed uh, pro uh, configurations properly, you can either create a D two uh, in a blocking manner, or you can uh, use an asynchronous manner where uh, you can subscribe uh, into the uh, D two creation event and then you use D two uh, within your application. So the exercise two is going to be about. Uh, uh, you know, initializing the SDK. Uh, and for doing that, uh, I mean, the first step is uh, really straightforward. Uh, I mean, uh, the exercise one, it's about, it's just about cloning the repository and uh, starting the application, which should uh, work um, without an issue. So the second exercise, uh, uh, I mean, uh, it, it, for the second exercise, you will have to uh, check out this ex01 configuration branch. So if you are, new to Android Studio and uh, uh, Git support on Android Studio, you can check out new branches by, uh, I think there's a slight delay. Uh, yeah, so you can, uh, I mean, if you check the uh, right hand bottom corner of the uh, Android Studio, there, there you will find the uh, branch name and you can simply click on that and uh, search for uh, the desired branch, which is going to be uh, EX01 configuration in our case. So I'm going to do that, EX01 configuration. So you will get uh, several uh, branches with the same name, but uh, choose the latest one, which is, uh, 2022 20, 5 online. So that is the latest version of this exercise. And you can go ahead and check check uh, check it out. And then you should uh, you should uh, get a, a Java class called SDK.java, which has some uh, blank uh, method where you will have to uh, create the uh, create and init initialize the uh, D2 instance. And also the I want to mention that uh, this D2 instance is a singleton. So uh, there will be only one instance of D2 for the entire lifetime of the uh, application, which is uh, really important to uh, avoid conflicts. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, write that piece of code, uh, but I think there's a slight delay between uh, my screen and the Zoom. Uh, but I hope you will be able to uh, follow it. I mean, uh, 
I think uh, since the uh, large screen is not clear, if you could join the Zoom channel, then uh, it will be more clear for everyone. Some kind of a name. Uh, and then uh, pass a version. So I will add that as 0 0.0.1. And then uh, I'm going to, I mean, uh, it, I mean you, you should be able to read, uh, I mean, all the instructions. It's available as an annotation in the exercise, exercise itself. So it is asking us to. I uh, use the DT configuration builder and set the context and uh, set uh, your username as the app name and then set the version and then uh, uh, set timeouts. I mean, connection timeouts, read timeouts, and write timeouts uh, as two minutes. And when setting those timeouts, uh, these timeouts are uh, accepted in seconds. So we will be setting 120 as the uh, write timeout. And Read timeout and uh, connection timeout. And then finally, uh, once you are done with all the configurations, you can simply call build, which will uh, give us back a DD configuration. And then you can return. And there are, uh, there are uh, other configurations like adding network interceptors. So uh, if you need to intercept all the network calls to uh, DHIS to server by the SDK and you know use for some kind of debugging or analysis, then uh, this is where you can set them as well. So the uh, the uh, skeleton application uh, kind of has this already. So I mean uh, it is using Flipper. Uh, it, it's a tool by Meta uh, for debugging Android. Uh, so if you prefer, you can uh, set that as well. But uh, if you don't have Flipper on your uh, machine currently installed, then uh, uh, you don't have to do that. Um, so I hope everyone is following and uh, do you need more time? Uh, so since this one is a really the simple one, I will just move on to the next section and uh, this session is going to be recorded. So I, hopefully you will be able to uh, follow the exercises later uh, as well. Uh, so the next next uh, uh, section of the workflow is about uh, logging in. Uh, and now we, we have initialized the uh, SDK and it is ready to use. And before doing any, any uh, operations on data or metadata or interacting with uh, the remote DHIS2 server, we have to log in into the application with the valid DHIS2 user. Uh, 
Uh, and the good thing with the SDK is that it supports multiple user server combinations. So you can use the same application across multiple servers and uh, multiple users can log in into the same application. So how it handles that is uh, internally, it's going to have, uh, have a separate encrypted database uh, per user server combination. So uh, once, once a user log in, in uh, into the application via the SDK for the first time, Obviously, uh, the SDK has to be uh, online uh, when it's, it's uh, happening for the first time. And uh, if, if that uh, login is successful, uh, SDK is going to you know, cache that uh, username and password uh, uh, combination. I mean, it's not going to keep that in plain text. It's going to create a hash and it's going to uh, persist that into the, uh, into the database. And then uh, the same user can log in for the second time uh, uh, while the app is offline, uh, the SDK is going to compare the hash of the username and password combination uh, 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 locally, and it's, it, 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 it kind of allows uh, the user to log in if, if there's a match. Uh, so, uh, so this basically explains uh, what I just described, uh, and uh, the. Uh, yeah, the only only a hard requirement is that the user has to be uh, the SDK has to be online if, if the user is new. So that's that's basically about it. And uh, in logout, uh, uh, SDK uh, kind of uh, disables any interactions with the local database and the remote server uh, for that particular user. But uh, once you log out, it's not going to clear uh, any databases. Uh, so it's it's going to preserve the database uh, for that user and server uh, encrypted, and uh, it could uh, pull up the uh, pull up the database if, if there's a subsequent login from the same user. So it's not going to clear any data, but uh, it will just uh, cut off the user from any new interactions once uh, the user is logged out. And logging in and uh, logging out uh, with the SDK is super simple. Uh, so I mean, compared to what we had to do before we had the SDK. So uh, you simply have to uh, get the D2, D2 object, which is the entry point of the uh, entry point for any SDK related operation, and then get the uh, corresponding module. So in this case, we are doing an user operation. So we have to get the user module, and then you can simply call login uh, and pass the username, password, and uh, the URL to the server. And then it would, uh, I mean, as long as the uh, application uh, SDK is online, it will allow you to log in. And then uh, for logout, it's simply calling user module.logout because at, at, at a given point, there can be only one active user. So it's simply calling logout, it will uh, log that user out. Uh, so the uh, third exercise is, uh, uh, around uh, the user authentication. So uh, it's available in this uh, EX02 login branch. So uh, I hope you will be able to check, uh, check out that branch and uh, uh, you simply will have to, uh, you know, uh, fill some uh, methods in login big model class and uh, login activity. Uh, Java class. So those are the two places where you will have to implement uh, login. And uh, you, you, I mean, the the, uh, the logout is omitted in this exercise. You simply have to do a login, and then you can uh, and show uh, you can show up show a toast message uh, welcoming the user. Maybe uh, simply uh, do a toast saying welcome, and then user. So I'm going to do the same thing, and uh, I hope you will be able to follow and uh, or maybe follow the maybe you'll be able to follow the recording later. So whichever you prefer. So if you have changes in the uh, changes from the uh, previous branch, so since uh, this is just for exercises. Uh, you can simply do a force checkout, then it will discard all the uh, non committed changes and simply check out the uh, branch that you need. Uh, so the first class that we have to modify is login view, uh, login view model .java. And here we have an annotation uh, uh, 
uh, explaining the exercise. So uh, it is asking us to call login method in your user module and it has provided us with the username, password and the server URL. So as usual, uh, I will have to uh, get hold of the D2 instance and then I'm going to do something regarding the users. So that means I need the user module and there I can call login uh, username password and server and then uh, the the next class that uh, I'm going to edit is login activity .java, where I will be uh, doing a task uh, to the user so this is an activity so I can simply pass this as the context uh, and then I will, I'm going to print a message hello user and uh, I'll just print the name and some exclamation marks and the length of the toast may be uh, it's going to be a long toast and then you have to simply go to uh, show at the end and now if I run the application It's going to start the application and uh, give me a UI to uh, enter the server URL, username and password. So this, this uh, server is currently offline, so we can probably use uh, play instance. So I'm going to use the 2.37 uh, instance here. And I will be logging in with the uh, admin distributor. So if, if the sign-in is successful, you should we should uh, see this post message saying uh, hello, uh, John. And uh, yeah, so uh, I was following, or do you do you need time to try it out, or should I just press it? Oh, okay. Yeah, so then uh, I'll move on to the next uh, stage of the workflow, which is about synchronization. And when it comes to synchronization, uh, we have two uh, types of data that needs to be synchronized. The first type is metadata, uh, and the second type is going to be uh, data. So uh, uh, metadata synchronization is crucial before you know doing anything else uh, on this instance or the on, on the application. And before going into the uh, uh, more code level examples, let me uh, introduce you to the data access layer of the uh, Android SDK. So it has two components, public and private. So public part is something that, uh, 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 something where the developer can freely access. Uh, I mean, it, it is like, you can freely call these uh, methods uh, uh, up to the repository. So we have the, uh, D2 at the top, which is kind of like the entry point. And then D2 exposes us to several modules. And these modules can be user modules, uh, tracker, tracked entity modules, and then event modules, and so on. So there are different, different modules. And then within those modules, we have repositories, which kind of encapsulates uh, operations on these uh, entities. And then if we call any, any method uh, on these repositories, then it goes to the private space where a valid user or a valid authentication is required. So it could be a database access or it could be an API access. Uh, and for both of these cases, a valid authentication is required and it, it is going to be controlled by the uh, SDK. And as I previously, previously mentioned, uh, before you do anything with the SDK, uh, I mean, anything data related with the SDK, uh, you have to have the SDK D2 uh, uh, instance configured, and you have to have a valid user login. So these these are uh, these three are the uh, uh, three or two steps are uh, the kind of like the prerequisites for using the rest of the modules and repositories in the SDK. 
and yeah so the first thing uh, that i would uh, show you uh, here is the metadata synchronization which is kind of like the third uh, mandatory step after a login uh, i mean you can't do anything related to data without actually having metadata so we can consider this as the third mandatory step uh, so it's really simple. I mean, uh, imagine what you had to do before you had SDK. I mean, you had all each and every API endpoint, uh, metadata API endpoint to, you know, uh, synchronize, download the uh, metadata. You had to handle paging and everything and uh, populate your database with those metadata. Not to mention that uh, uh, you even had to, you know, create the database, uh, the database tables and the, the relationship between those tables and everything you had to do kind of manually. But now you simply have to call uh, D2 metadata mod, uh, module and you can do a blocking download of metadata and it's going to take care of everything uh, for you. It's, it's just a one line of code. And then with downloading data, so uh, mainly we have uh, three types of data uh, in, in, in any DHIS instance. Uh, uh, or in an uh, Android uh, application. So the tracked entity data uh, and event data and aggregated data. So, I mean, it's it's simple. Uh, I mean, if, if you want to do something with the SDK, it's simple uh, uh, to, uh, you know, determine what uh, methods should be called. So you have to first st uh, start with the D2 and then uh, realize what you need to do. So if you want to uh, download track, uh, track, track, track entity data, then obviously you have to uh, select the track entity module. So, I mean, uh, the, uh, that structure and uh, intelligence by ID combined makes, makes it really easy for you to uh, find the uh, corresponding uh, methods in the SDK without having to go through lengthy documentation. So in this case, uh, if I want to uh, download tracked entity data, I will then need to, and then the tracked entity module, and then the repository is going to be, so tracked entity is just downloaded, and then it provides us uh, some capabilities to limit the, uh, uh, limit what we are downloading. So we can maybe limit, uh, limit the number of instances to 10, or maybe you can limit by program ID, you can limit by organization unit ID, so those kind of, limits are uh, uh, provided by the SDK itself to uh, provide, uh, I mean, to avoid uh, flooding the network. And then you can simply call download uh, once, you are, uh, once you have, you know, called, called all the configuration methods uh, related to this download. And same applies for events. So if you want to download events, uh, you start with D2, and then uh, we need to do something with events. That means we need to get the event module and then what we need to do with, with the events is downloading. So that means we need the event downloader repository. And then we can uh, do the configurations, like setting the limits, and then finally the action call, which is the download. Uh, and um, if, if, if you're not uh, doing, uh, I mean, if you're not building an application with uh, the SDK, uh, I mean, if, 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 if you assume that you are using the REST API, you will uh, remember that with most of the uh, uh, data endpoints of DHIS2, it provides filtering and ordering. So the same uh, support is available there in the SDK. So yeah, I mean, it, I mean, um, you simply have to call a combination of uh, methods to achieve the same thing that you achieve with the uh, REST API. So uh, for instance, if you want to filter uh, events uh, based on the organization unit and the event date, you can simply do that by again going through the same hierarchy. So you, uh, I mean, we are we are doing something with the event, so we need the event, events module, and then the repository. So we are going to do a, a read on the event. So we are getting the events repository, and then we we will be setting the filtering uh, parameters. So in this case, I will be filtering with organization unit ID, and that ID is going to be equal to uh, some kind of an organization or, or UID, and then I, I would like to filter that by event date, and uh, I want all the events that comes after this particular date. So it supports all the, uh, uh, I mean, possibilities like before, after, and things like that. So then uh, once you are uh, done with configuring, configuring the repository, you can simply call the action 
action method which is in this case going to be get uh, previously it was download and in this case it's going to be a get and uh, same applies for ordering so it is also uh, also another kind of configuration that can be done on the repository so i can simply uh, ask the sdk to order my events by uh, event date and i can specify whether i need ascending or descending order so it's really easy to uh, use filtering and ordering with sdk i mean it's um, it's uh, straightforward um, and then the uh, other, other, another important feature uh, available on the SDK uh, and especially the data access layer is uh, requesting uh, for nested fields. So if you can remember uh, how it works on the API when we call the event set point, uh, uh, it's not automatically going to uh, give us the data values. Instead, we, we have to uh, specify that we need the data values as well because otherwise it, the payload is going to be really, really huge. Uh, and in, in, in this case, uh, I mean, if we I mean, assume how the data is stored in uh, the Android uh, uh, SQLite database, so there, there will be probably two tables, unlike in the DHIS2 uh, database case. Uh, so in order to prevent, uh, you know, uh, unnecessary joints, uh, we have to uh, manually request for the nested field. So in this case, if I need the data values included in the uh, result set. I will. I will have to manually specify that I need the data values uh, with the with the final result. So if I can specify that with that by uh, do uh, doing another configuration call, uh, which is with tracked entity data values. So now it's going to uh, do all these filterations and then do all this. Uh, I mean, do the ordering that I have uh, requested, and also it's going to join that with the uh, data values table and fetch all the data values uh, uh, corresponding to the events and then build the final payload and uh, final Java object and send them uh, back to us. Uh, yeah, so the next exercise is going to be about uh, synchronizing metadata and data. Uh, so it's basically implementing the, uh, uh, the same things that we just uh, discussed. And uh, it's going to be available under exercise three, sync and list uh, branch. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, do that and I uh, hope you will be able to follow and maybe later use the recording uh, to complete the exercises. So the exercise is going to be ex 3 uh, sync and list. I'm going to check out and I'm going to do a post checkout because I don't need my previous changes. And then I'm, uh, I have this, uh, so the uh, main edits are going to be on the main activity and the programs activity. So if I go to the main activity, I should be able to find uh, my exercise here. Uh, so the first exercise is to uh, download metadata. Uh, so for that, I have to do SDK D2 metadata. And uh, I have to get the metadata module and simply do a download. And uh, if I go back to uh, just to show you how these uh, methods are being called. Um, so when the sync metadata is called, uh, I mean, in the skeleton application, we have these buttons uh, for syncing metadata, syncing data, and also for uploading data. So once the sync metadata is called, it's going to uh, call uh, the download metadata function that, uh, that we just implemented. And it's going to do that on the IO threads. And once that call is done, it's going to hand over the uh, control back to the Android main thread and if the uh, if there's an error in the uh, metadata download, it's simply going to print uh, print the stack trace for now. And, uh, for now, and if the operation is successfully completed, <clears throat> it's going to start the uh, program activity and show us a list of programs that that, uh, that got synchronized by the uh, operation that we just did. So similarly, I should be able to go ahead and install, uh, uh, implement the tracked entity instance synchronizations. So I need the tracked entity module, and I am going to download 
the uh, tractated instances. So that's the repository I need. And I can simply call uh, the download uh, function. And same applies for the events, SPK, D2, I need events. And I need the event downloader and then simply call download. And also, uh, you should be able to uh, add limits here, as I mentioned. So you have multiple options. You can limit. Uh, you can simply add a global limit, or you can uh, sim uh, you can limit by organization unit or limit by program. So if it is a global unit, it's going to just download track. Uh, I mean, if you set the limit to ten, it's going to download ten track entity instances. But if you limit by organization unit, uh, it's going to download ten track entity instances from each organization unit accessible by this user. Uh, uh, so for this exercise, I'm going to simply set uh, a limit of 10 as instructed, uh, and I will be doing the same for the events as well. And then I have the I have to do the uh, aggregated data, and uh, for aggregated data, uh, there's no such thing called uh, limits because it's kind of like uh, um, I mean limit is. I mean, we can't define a limit for the aggregated data. So I can simply get the data repository and simply uh, or download. So it will go ahead and download uh, the aggregated data for, for me. And now, if I uh, run the application, it should uh, build the application and uh, start it. So I have, uh, in this application, I have, uh, when in the run configuration, I have set this. Uh, flag to clear up storage before deployment. Since we are do, doing multiple different different examples, it's easy to uh, uh, let it clear all the data uh, uh, when we are deploying the application. Otherwise, we will have to manually uh, go and clear the application data if we encounter any errors. So I'm going to log in again into the uh, play instance. And when the login is successful, I can simply click on Sync Metadata. And it, it's going to take a uh, few seconds to synchronize metadata. Uh, depends on the uh, speed of your network. Uh, so let's allow it to do the synchronization. And once the synchronization is done, it should, uh, I mean, based on what we have instructed here, uh, it's going to uh, start the uh, or open the program activity. Yeah, so now it has opened the program activity, and the second component uh, component of this uh, exercise is to implement uh, uh, implement or complete the program activity so that it will read programs uh, from. Uh, from from the uh, metadata that we just synchronized and display them on a list, but uh, I will just simply skip that uh, that step for now because uh, it's really really straightforward. You just have to take the program uh, module and then uh, you know just query it. So let me uh, introduce you to the data states which are being used in the Android SDK. So this is uh, something related to that I. First, described uh, uh, about handling everything uh, manually. So, if, if you want to handle everything manually, we kind of have to manually manage all these uh, states within the database. Uh, but uh, at the moment, SDK is doing everything for us. So, there are several states uh, that are being used by the SDK to, uh, to properly handle the synchronization between uh, the uh, local application and the remote server. And uh, the first one is uh, sync, so which which uh, stands for, uh, uh, I mean, which indicates that all the uh, elements related to a record has been already synchronized, uh, and there are no local changes for that value. Uh, for instance, if it is a tracked tracked entity, uh, uh, maybe a tracked entity uh, attribute, then uh, when you newly created it, uh, it won't have the sync uh, flag. It will have something like two post flag because it should be, it is yet to be synchronized with the server. 
can once all the uh, data is uh, data related to that particular entry is synchronized properly back to the server and if the, if the server acknowledges that the uh, synchronization is successful then it's going to change the state back to this input and uh, the next next state is to post uh, which 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 is uh, added for the newly created uh, entries uh, which uh, kind of indicate that this, this data is only available locally and this should be synchronized with the server. Uh, and the next state is to update, uh, which is uh, the state that will be used for the uh, already synchronized objects. But uh, once the synchronization is done, there has been, an, uh, so there has been some kind of an edit. Uh, uh, happened on that object. Uh, so it can be like if, if there's a tracked entity attribute uh, called name and uh, if it is uh, already synchronized and if, if, if a user change that name to something else, this will be the state that will be used to uh, indicate that change. So this is uh, the kind of like the workflow of uh, uh, changing uh, state states uh, within the database. Uh, so if we create something new, it will be two posts. Uh, the state will be to post and then when we click on the uh, upload data it will simply go ahead and uh, change uh, the state to uploading which indicates that upload is uh, still ongoing uh, and if the uh, upload is successful it will be it will go to the uh, sync state and uh, while the up upload is going on uh, i mean it is also allowed to uh, edit edit that record i mean it is uh, imagine how hard it would be to implement this on, in, in, uh, on our own. So if, if I, I mean, if there's an edit while the upload is going on, SDK is going to uh, add the flag to update to that record. And even if the previous upload is successful, it's not going to change that flag back to sync because there are new updates uh, on the on our object. And then we have uh, two other states to uh, handle errors and warnings, which are kind of like uh, self-explanatory. And these, these are the two most important uh, states that I would like to uh, show you today. That's sent via SMS and sync via SMS. So uh, previously, when we, uh, when we were developing Android applications, we, had, we kind of had only one option for synchronizing uh, data from Android application to the server. So, uh, so I mean, what happened at the community level was uh, the users kind of uh, collect data within the day, and then they come back to the uh, come back to their office uh, where they have internet connections, and then only they could synchronize data into the uh, into into the servers. So, especially that was what uh, uh, what we have been doing with the DNMS application uh, in Sri Lanka. But now, uh, with, with the SDK, we have the support for synchronizing uh, data via SMSs. Uh, so SDK kind of use some uh, compression uh, libraries to compress uh, uh, data and efficiently transfer them uh, into the server via SMSs. And also, uh, it relies on uh, uh, responses back from the server, which indicates the uh, success or failure of importing uh, those data. Uh, and uh, there are some cases uh, when, when, when uh, the SMS gateways are not configured or if there's, if there's no SMS gateway at all, there are some cases uh, where uh, I mean, the server does not uh, send any response. So in that cases, uh, uh, the SDK will simply have sent via SMS state. And uh, I mean, if there's a response back from this uh, server, uh, and if, if, if the response is, uh, well, I mean, if it is successful, it will simply add uh, sync via SMS, which is kind of the uh, best state that we could have when synchronizing uh, via SMS. All right. So the uh, next uh, one is about uh, tracked entity instance search, uh, and uh, I mean. There, there are other, other search uh, options as well, like event search and all, but uh, tracked entity search is kind of special because um, it supports multiple modes. Like, I mean, it supports four modes. Uh, so the first mode available is offline only. So in this case, uh, if you do a tracked entity instance search, it's going to search only the uh, locally available Android database. 
um, and um, so yeah, it, it will only include uh, locally available tracked entity instances. And then we have the we have the next option offline first. And if we specify that, uh, and uh, and if the device is online, the SDK is going to first search uh, the local database and get all the TEIs available, and then do an online search, uh, and then do some kind of a duplicate handling to eliminate duplicates uh, that came from both local and online. And then it's going to append that uh, online result uh, uh, to the bottom of the uh, offline results and present it uh, to the user. And then we have online only search where we it will simply ignore the locally stored uh, data. So if, if, if the user has uh, some uh, uh, non synchronized uh, tracked entity instances on the device, this search will not include them. It will uh, only include uh, tracked entity instances from the um, remote server. And then same, same as offline first, we have online first, where it will include all the TEIs from the remote server first, and then uh, it will go in the local database and handle the duplicates and uh, append, those, uh, append that result back to the uh, um, result from the online database and present that to the user. So this is kind of like how that uh, happens. So I mean, uh, so if we, if we kind of have a request for ordering, it's going to order within these subgroups. Um, so this is uh, this is kind of like showing the offline first mode. So it's going to uh, take offline data from the data, uh, from the local database. So the one, two, three are going to be from local database, and then it's going to request from the remote server and TDI four, five are going to be remote server, and they, they are going to be in two different, I mean, they are going to be in the same result set, but they are going to be arranged uh, uh, in, in this manner. Uh, so the uh, so the sample syntax for uh, query tracked entity instances is, uh, uh, I mean, this is, uh, uh, I mean, it, it, it would look something like this. So uh, it, it, it's same as before, we, we need to do something with the tracked entity instances. So we start with D2 and we need to get the tracked entity module and then we need to do a query. So you, I mean, on, 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 with intelligence, you, you should simply, uh, I mean, from here you can simply search for query and it, it should probably suggest uh, the method that needs to be called. And then, uh, then you can add all the configurations. I mean, if you want to filter by organization units, uh, uh, or if you if you want to set some kind of an old unit mode, uh, and also if you want to search by program, so those kind of configurations can be added here. And then, that is about filtering. And then we can do ordering. So you can order by attributes, uh, order by enrollment date, and and you can specify one of the four uh, modes that uh, I just described. And then also you can add some paging if, if it is necessary. And then uh, it should, uh, you know, do the magic for you. Um, so the exercise four is an uh, optional exercise that's about uh, uh, querying tracked entity instances uh, based on the uh, syntax that I just showed. Um, whether we have time. So we're due to end now. So we started half an hour late. So <laughs> um, it kind of depends on going or if they want to take a bit of a break. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I have one more section to cover. So I'll uh, probably skip this exercise because it's, it was optional anyway. And uh, yeah, the, the last last uh, uh, part of the session is about data creation. So data creation is required if you want to, you know, uh, support uh, a screen like this where you have a data entry form, entry form and uh, you want to create uh, tracked entity instances and tracked entity attributes. Uh, so again, it's it's I mean uh, when when you are using the SDK, you really don't have to follow any uh, documentation. You simply uh, you simply have to rely on intelligence. Uh, so we start with D2 and we can get the tracked entity module and then uh, we want to create a tracked entity instance. And in, 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 so that, that is the repository we, we, we need. And that in, the, in that repository, we can simply call and add. 
uh, where you can use uh, track entity instance, create projection uh, to you know set the uh, 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 configurations, and then uh, you can you can simply add that to the local database. So it's not going to add into the remote database yet. Uh, so it, it will first add that to the local database, and when you do a synchronization, it's going to uh, upload stuff to the uh, uh, remote database. So the next uh, exercise is about uh, uh, about that actually creating tracked entity instances. So if you have if you have time, I could uh, go ahead and do the demo. Or if you don't. Oh, yeah, maybe try and wrap up in that fifteen. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah. So the uh, if you want to follow with me, so the exercise is going to be on ex09 tracker tracker data creation, and I will go ahead and check out that branch. Uh, so the exercise is about. Uh, so it says uh, in the side menu you can go to the programs and you can select a program and when you click on plus button. We should be able to create a new tracked entity instance. So if we, I mean, let me run, run the application without doing any code level changes, just to uh, show you the show you how it works. Uh, it works up to the point where we want to create a tracked entity instance. Uh, also, if, I mean, when, when you're trying these exercises uh, offline, if you I mean, if you want to use your own instance, uh, you should be able to uh, change these uh, hard coded values uh, here uh, in the strings XML. So search for autofill URL, autofill username, and autofill password. Sorry, and, and you should be able to change these values. So every time you run the application, it will uh, automatically fill those values for you. So in my case, it's going to be a in this script, and I will run the application. Um, so it, it, have, it, it has filled the form uh, with the desired values. Now let me do uh, metadata synchronization first because I need the uh, programs. If I want to uh, add a tracked entity instance and enroll uh, that tracked entity instance into a program. And while it's uh, loading, let me uh, go ahead with the exercise. So the, uh, the first part of the exercise is about uh, creating the actual tracked entity instance. So, so it's going to be down on tracked entity instance activity. Uh, okay, the synchronization is done. So we have uh, the uh, we have all the programs loaded. Uh, so if I click on the child program and if I click on plus. It's not doing anything because we haven't done the implementation. So that's what we are going to do now. Uh, so I have the retracted it instance activity. So I'm going to get that. So I have exercise. 9A tracked entity data creation. So it says set any organization unit in capture scope. Set the tracked entity type associated uh, to the program. So I'm going to clear this. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the D2 tracked entity module and tracked it. Uh, from the module, I want to get the tracked entity instance repository and simply call that. And then you can rely on IntelliSense to uh, be, uh, you know, uh, do the rest of the coding. And then I have the tracked entity instance creation, create projection builder, and I have to set the tracked entity type here. And then the organization unit. Yeah. So then I'm done with the exercise nine. I, I have already. I, I have. I have created a tracked entity instance, and I have saved that to the uh, uh, the local database 
uh, when I'm done with these uh, four lines of code. And the exercise 9b is enrolling this trapped entity instance uh, into a program. So it is available, it is available under the enrollment form activity. So I'm going to go to the exercise B. So it's the enrollment form service. Uh, it's, yeah, this one. And here uh, I have to create an enrollment. So I can again rely on the IntelliSense. So this is what I need to do. I need to create enrollment create projection and uh, set uh, organization unit. I mean, I have to configure uh, the enrollment with all the required parameters. And track entity <laughs> is going to be the EI. UID and these are the uh, all I mean these are the mandatory para parameters for creating an enrollment. So once it is done, I can uh, uh, I mean the enrollment repository is going to point at uh, that uh, newly created enrollment. So I can go ahead and set the enrollment date and incident date uh, to the uh, new enrollment. Yeah, that's done. Exercise uh, 9B and then exercise 9C will be uh, it's about adding tracked entity attribute values. Uh, so the exercise wants us to save the value if not empty, otherwise clear, clear the attribute value uh, and delete the existing value if there's any. Uh, so I mean, I will first handle the uh, empty case. So I can simply use this empty uh, utility function from uh, the Android uh, main, uh, native SDK. Uh, and I'm going to check whether the value is empty. And if the value is empty, I can uh, hold um, delete that exists. Because I have already loaded loaded the value. Uh, I mean, I, I, I have I mean, the, 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 the code for the exercise has already loaded the corresponding uh, tracked entity attribute value. So the now the repository points at that value. And if the value exists, I can simply uh, instruct the uh, SDK to delete that value. And if it is not, uh, I, I should be able to uh, set maybe a, do a blocking set uh, to update the value, and I'm going to uh, just do a uh, just do a uh, print stack trace if there's an exception. So all the blocking calls, uh, I mean, we should ex expect an exception with the with all the blocking calls. Uh, yeah, so that's all I have to do here. So. Now uh, I can simply uh, apply my code changes without having to reload the application. So uh, there's an option called apply code, code changes in the Android Studio. So if I click on that, it's going to build uh, the program and then apply changes. Now if I click on the plus button, uh, it's going to uh, show me the enrollment form where I can uh, set the last name, first name, and gender. and uh, and, and uh, save the tracked entity instance. Uh, as a bonus um, uh, step in the uh, uh, in this exercise, we have uh, you know we have an uh, uh, automatically generated ID for this tracked entity instance. So let me show you how uh, easily we can generate uh, uh, you know uh, uh, such unique IDs uh, for uh, tracked uh, for any kind of tracked entity attribute. So that, that is available under enrollment form service uh, as the exercise 09B. Uh, so all the you know coding has been done for us. We simply have to uh, generate generate uh, a value here. Uh, so I, I want to do a 
um, I'm, I want to use a reserved value. So how, how this generation happens is uh, it's going to, you know, when the device is offline, uh, it's going to request the remote instance for some values generated uh, for this device. Uh, let's say it, it generates 100, 100 values for us. And then when the device is offline, it's going to use those values. Uh, so that's how it works. Otherwise, uh, there's no way for avoiding the collisions. So uh, since this is a tracked entity attribute, I am going to use tracked entity module. And uh, so I want to use a reserved value. And I will do a blocking gate uh, for that reserved value. And I have to pass the attribute ID. So that I can get from UID. And also I need to uh, as the organization unit because these values are relative to the organization unit. So for that one, I'm going to get the current involvement and do a blocking gate and simply get the organization unit and that's all. Now if I uh, reload the code and click on plus, uh, plus button, so it's going to uh, give us a uh, reserve value. I mean, we are going to use uh, use one of the reserve value. And now we can uh, simply uh, fill in the form and uh, click on save. So, it will, uh, so this is something that I created. So this is for the previously uh, created one. So it's anyway going to create the tracked entity, but uh, once the enrollment form is filled out, it's going to create the enrollment and, uh, and the attribute. So this is the one that we just created. Um, yeah, so that's uh, all I have for the uh, for this session. And uh, so before having to uh, go really really fast and not uh, not being able to allow you some time to try the exercises. And before I uh, conclude, I want to especially thank uh, Dr. Gracia and the UIO Android team for providing us with this material and uh, exercises. So that's all. Uh, and just to follow up on that as well, so if anyone's got any questions, uh, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Uh, yeah, you can uh, send me a message. Cool. Um, sweet. Thanks. Uh, we'll take a break now for 20 minutes and come back for the final session uh, at half past. <laughs>